make a conclusion about the policy on forced marriages. And this was her answer on the 14th of September 2016 at 3.10 in the afternoon, it was Defense Council's question. And she explained the research was not investigating anything about policy. She went on to say in that answer, same answer, but my follow-up researches confirmed the serial pattern of forced marriages were forced during the Khmer Rouge time. So Levine didn't concentrate on studying the perpetrators. She was interested in the victims. But what she saw was a pattern of forced marriages around the country in the areas that she looked at. Which reminds me of one of the examples um, one of the defense counsel, Mr. Liv Savannah, raised in his uh, remarks. He said, how can you hold the center leaders responsible for forced marriages? What if in a village in Cambodia today, a village chief orders a couple to get married? Would you then indict the central government in Phnom Penh, the leaders of the CPK or whoever, for, excuse me, the leaders of the uh, regime for forced marriage? Uh, the answer is, Look at the difference in context. Of course not, because in the DK regime, this didn't happen in one village to one couple. The evidence before you, you from the witnesses, from civil parties, from the experts, is that it happened throughout the country in often mass weddings, weddings of sometimes dozens, sometimes many more people. Often couples who had never even met before they were instructed to get married. One of the testimonies I think was absolutely clear in showing that this was a central policy and in showing the coercion that everyone felt who was told by Ankar who were to be married was a testimony of Nok Nguyen. Recall her. She was a southwest zone cadre, eventually sent to the northwest zone, given a, 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 a relatively high position, I believe, deputy the district secretary. And she said one day, Tamok came and told her and other women that she was with that 38 of them would marry a group of handicapped soldiers that they didn't even know. Tamok and Tatik attended the wedding ceremony. And she talked about that ceremony and she said during it, some of them were crying. She also said, quote, I also cried. I was disappointed, very disappointed, since I had never seen my would-be husband before the marriage day, although we were in the army. But if I had refused, I would have been killed. So I had to bear the situation. So this is a relatively mid-level or higher level cadre, at least mid-level cadre, trusted by the regime, chosen by Ta Mok for this position. She was afraid of being killed, but she refused to marry a person that she had never met before, a handicapped soldier. You can imagine what ordinary people in, uh, in these villages around the country, the terror they felt that forced them to accept this re instruction from Ankara to marry. A couple of very small points um, regarding some of the defense uh, arguments in the last few days. At one point, the Ministry of Defense claimed that the, the prosecution made a ridiculous claim in the brief, in our brief, that DK deceived Vietnam by negotiating to gain time to prepare forces. I suggest that they look at the footnote uh, to the, on the brief to that point. Because the footnote is to the minutes of the 11 March 1976 Standing Committee meeting, E3-217. That meeting states exactly what we wrote in our brief, that they were negotiating and that they intended to gain time to prepare forces. 
about Vietnam, the by your the bill time to the also criticized the bill. prosecution brief and read a portion of a sentence where we said that DK acted under the delusion in the early part of the regime, acted under the delusion they faced imminent danger from Vietnam early in the regime. The portion of the sentence they did not read is that this is what Stephen Morris said. Stephen Morris was the expert witness on DK Vietnamese relations that Nguyen Chia proposed. The statement that they criticized is directly out of his book. Now, Your Honors, both of the accused have given various excuses in attempts to evade their criminal responsibility. Some of their various positions in this case and over time even contradict each other. But both of them, to varying extents, Nun Chia much more than Q Sampan, but both of them have attempted to justify the crimes of the regime. And I want to talk about that now. I think this is very important. In the Nun Chia brief, final trial brief, paragraph. 540, they claim that there's a legal basis to arrest and detain people because of suspicion of participation in unlawful activities. And they go on the brief to claim they have a right to kill those they suspected of being disloyal to their regime. Q Sampan has also done this at times. We haven't heard much of that in their final arguments. But in their final trial brief, for example, in paragraph 1466, they claim that security centers, and we've, we've heard the testimony of what these security centers were. They were killing machines. But Q Sampan says security centers were, quote, a firm response to rebellious movements and that they would, quote, isolate individuals deemed dangerous to DK stability. Honest, what does the evidence show about how they isolated individuals? They isolated them by burying them in mass graves. Nguyen Chi has been much more upfront about this during the trial and even before the trial. He told Tet Samba in the book, uh, he's quoted in the book Behind the Killing Fields, and this quote the defense also included in one of their submissions last year, his lawyers included this, quote, Nguyen Chi doesn't apologize for S21. Nguyen Chia doesn't apologize for S21, even though his niece and others close to him were sent there. Now, as we've heard evidence about S21, we've seen from recovered documents, as we show in our brief, approximately of the surviving documents, approximately 18,000 individuals were detained there according to those documents. And that's, you know, all documents did not survive, that's clear. But Nguyen Chia doesn't apologize for it. Rather, he tries to justify it, which is a position he's taken most of the time during the trial. But other times, in the trial and before, he's taken different positions in an attempt to evade his responsibility. E3-663 was a media interview with Nunchi. In that one, he said, quote, there was no S21. If it had existed, I would have been informed about it, but I never heard about it. It's one of many, many lies that Nunchi has told in an attempt to avoid his responsibility. While he sometimes expresses his moral responsibility and talks about his concern for the victims, Your Honors, those are crocodile tears, absolutely insincere, because as he has said, 
នៅវិញ្ញាណខណ្ឌរបស់ប្រជាពលរដ្ឋខ្ញុំដែលបានលះបងអាយុជីវិតហើយក៏ខ្ញុំទៅដែរនៅការសោកស្ដាយហើយច
trying to divert attention, divert responsibility, his own responsibility for what happened. His commander, other Northwest Zone cadre, we know where they were killed from. They were killed on purges from the center. But one of, perhaps, one of the most outrageous lies of Nun Chea in attempting to avoid his responsibility came in a setting very much like this, but it was the last day of the trial in case 2-1, 31st of October 2013, when he gave his final words in that case. And in his speech, he said the following, quote, I never met never supervised or ordered Doik to mistreat or kill anyone. Everyone should be aware that soldiers or security personnel would never listen to anyone besides their own commanders. Therefore, there is no reason that Doik should listen to me. Besides the ridiculousness of that statement coming from the number two person in the regime, Please listen to what he said next. Nun Chia said, Frankly speaking, I heard the name of Doik only after 1979. Your Honor, this contradicts many other things that Nun Chia has said. Going back to his extensive interviews, with Tet Sambat. <laughs> he talked there with ha to Tet Sambat that he had had, Nun Chea had had extensive discussions with Doik during the DK regime. He talked about how he discussed Doik with Tamok. He claimed that Tamok had warned him about Doik. And in a uh, quite detailed explanation of an event, in that book, Nun Chia talks about the time that Doik came to him with a confession implicating Kyu Sampan and how he had ordered Doik to ignore that. In the book, it says that Nun Chia told Tetsambat, Doik was not happy with me because I always blamed him for making mistakes. There's no question that Nun Chia knew Doik. He didn't hear the name Doik for the first time after 1979. It's just another outrageous, outrageous lie he tried to tell to avoid his responsibility, particularly his responsibility S21, where he simply has no excuse. Now I'd like to come to the most important part of the Nunchea In this trial, they don't deny the killings of S21. They can't. The evidence is simply overwhelming in another security center. But they claim that these are legally justified. They claim that they had a right to kill anyone because of, quote, a reasonable suspicion. They had a right to kill with no trial or legal process people that they considered disloyal. And then they cite as the reason that they have to be believed about that that this is their national security policy. They say, look what happened. We were overthrown. This regime that had enslaved people, impoverished people, murdered hundreds of thousands, maybe million people, was overthrown by a foreign invasion. They lost power. So therefore, they must have had a real national security, uh, national security issue, and therefore were entitled to kill people in order to preserve the regime. Your honors, the Nazi regime lost the war. It doesn't justify their crimes. The Ottoman Empire ceased to exist after the First World War. It doesn't justify the crimes that occurred. The Hutus lost to a Tutsi army that invaded. It doesn't justify the genocide. And the fact that the Khmer Rouge, the DK regime, was overthrown does not justify the horrible crimes that that regime committed. 
you know, Your Honor, just looking at the history of Cambodia alone, King Sina and his government were overthrown. Law Nol was overthrown in a war. Of course, the DK regime was overthrown. Ten years of another regime in civil war, and, and that regime lost the 1973 elections and partially lost power. Now, the fact that these regimes lost power mean that any crime that was committed by the regimes is excused because national security, you can kill anyone with no legal process and justify it. Of course not. That's the rule of no law. That's what Nunchi advocates, the rule of no law. And they go even further because Nunchi says Vietnam is an existential threat and always will be. It remains a constant, they say, in, for Cambodia for all time. So according to Nunchia, they would condemn the Cambodian people at all time that any government that feels they are threatened can kill anyone by and simply say, we believe you're an agent of Vietnam without any judicial process. Now, another way that defense tries to justify um, their crimes is they try to say, oh, well, there were, there were uh, competing factions within the party. There were rifts within the CPK. And that this somehow justifies the crimes. It doesn't. Now, even uh, said, objected very strenuously that the chamber was biased against them because you asked Nun Chia, what's the relevance of this evidence? Your Honor, all courts at all times have a right and a duty to ask about the relevance of evidence before parties take time to present evidence. <coughs> Uh, Nunchi never could show the relevance of the evidence, and that's why they objected so strongly to the question, because they had no answer to it. You know, sometimes they try to claim, well, the killings were by other factions of the regime that were disloyal to Pol Pot. What killings are you talking about exactly? S21? Run by Doik, uh, who was under Sun Sen, under Nun Chea. Are you talking about Krang Tichan, which was Tam Mok's area? Are you talking about the purge, the purge of the East Zone, of thousands and thousands of East Zone soldiers that the regime claimed were disloyal? If we go through all of the crime sites, there's one site, I believe, that was uh, operated under someone that Nun Chea claims uh, was from a competing faction. He has to claim it because they executed him in S21. And that was the Trapang Tamal. But the evidence we heard from witnesses was that when the southwest zone replaced Rukhnim's northwest zone at Trapang Tamal, things got no better. In fact, some witnesses said things got even worse. Your Honor, it's, it's uh, an easy question, but it's absolutely an incredibly important one that's facing you because of the Nunchia defense. They claim a right to extrajudicial killings. There is no such right in international law. We heard them speak for two days. They filed a 550-page brief. They cited no case that said you can kill a person who's not taking an active part in hostilities without a trial, without any judicial process. That simply is not allowed. And you know, they, they get a chance again to speak Friday. Please. If you have a case that says you can kill someone who's in detention, a prisoner, you can execute him without any trial, please show it to the court. There's no such case. There's no principle in international law that prisoners can be killed. And the evidence in our case about executions is that pretty much everyone who was executed was not taking an active part in hostilities. The, the, once a person is captured, they are not taking an active part in hostilities. 
persons who were in S21, Krang Tachan, the other uh, security centers, by definition, they're detained. They are not taking an active part in hostilities. The actual definition of active part in hostilities um, is limited to the time a person for a civilian is actually engaged in such an operation. Uh, so don't come back with a case that says that during an arrest or during a military operation, you can kill a person who's suspected of aiding the enemy. Find a case that says a person in detention can be killed without trial. There is none. You won't find any. And it would be a very, very dangerous world if any court would recognize such a defense. What the were, what the DK was, was literally a lawless state. There were no laws. They had a constitution and no laws. They had a parliament which was tasked by the constitution with creating laws, and it was headed by Munchea, and it passed now. There were no laws. Now, in a very feeble and weak attempt, and I'm not blaming the lawyers, let me make it clear, uh, we appreciate that lawyers, uh, play a, defense lawyers play a critical role, and when I'm attacking the arguments, it's because they have to play the hand that they're dealt with. The hand that they're dealt with is a very losing hand it's a, uh, on this issue and on this trial. So what they claimed in an attempt to try to find some basis is that in the DK Constitution, in paragraph 402, they talk about a constitutional provision that said, quote, and they claim this, that this justifies executions in places like S21 with no trial, no charges, no legal process. The constitutional provision says, quote, dangerous activities in opposition to the people's state must be condemned to the highest degree. So it includes no punishment. It says nothing about a penalty. It certainly doesn't say you can kill anybody. Dangerous activities, it doesn't define what are dangerous activities and who is to decide. This is not a law, it's not a criminal law, it's no basis for extrajudicial killings. What are dangerous activities according to Nunche? It's very interesting to look at their brief when they say that they are rewriting history and the evidence they say they show of this existential threat to the regime that justifies these thousands and thousands of executions of men, women, and children. Well, they gave a couple of examples that I found very interesting. On paragraph 250, they say, this is part of their crocodile history, 100 members of Chakri's forces were arrested at that location for stirring up discontent by creating the impression of arrest, unrest, raising banners with the slogan, Long Live Buddhism. So according to Nunchia, dangerous activities that justify execution are things like a banner, Long Live Buddhism. That's an existential threat to the DK regime. That's interesting for two reasons. One, it shows, contrary to the submissions of both defense teams, the regime absolutely prohibited Buddhism. And the DK regime understood that Buddhism, a gentle religion, was incompatible with its own philosophy. And secondly, it shows that the people who were killed simply for expressing their religious beliefs. Paragraph 251 has the next evidence of these dangerous activities against the state that justify S21. And this was graffiti. It was written, quote, small fry eats little, big shot eats a lot. According to the brief, this said, this led the Khmer Rouge to conclude the division of 70 was a graffiti saying, basically, against corruption. Small fry eats little, big shot eats a lot. Graffiti against inequality, which, according to the uh, Nunchea team, is the basic tenet of the communist police beliefs. But if someone expresses it when they're in power, that's reason to condemn an entire division 
ជាអមរតបងហើយយកមកទៅរណកម្មហើយចង់ក្រោយសម្រាប់អ្នកទៅនោះចោលបែបនេះទេណានុនជាមេកស៊ីណាដើវ៉ាលៀនតបុតហ